Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. Blessed Sunday and happy Mother's Day on this 10th day of May. Um, this snowy 10th day of May. Yeah, here in Essex, it's snowing. I expect it might be in Morrisville as well. Um, I'm uh, Barb Lemmel. I'm the interim pastor at the United Community Church in Morrisville, and I'm joined by uh, Mitchell Hay, who's the pastor at the Essex Center United Methodist Church. And it's good to have all of you with us this morning as we share together in some worship and uh, warm thoughts for a chilly morning, um, even though it's May. <laughs> Spring is coming, but it's not quite here yet. Um, so um, thanks to Catherine and June for the music that already was shared uh, in this live stream. And thanks in advance to Sean Boer for the music that we'll have at the end of the service today. Thanks always to Jeremy, our tech guru, and to Louise Allen, who will be reading scripture for us. This is definitely a group project, not just the creation of the two of us by mm -hmm. any means. Um, and thanks to God, who we hope and believe is uh, in and through all of this. So Mitch and I will join in a call to worship this morning. If you have the bulletin that we sent out in front of you, you're welcome to join along. Um, or just listen and um, be with us as we enter together into a, an atmosphere of worship. Good God, we gather here. We gather as your people. With open ears to hear your word and to hear the groaning of your world. We gather as your people. With open eyes to see your presence and to see the suffering of your children. We gather as your people. With open hearts to feel your love and to love the neighbor and the stranger. We gather as your people. With open doors to welcome all your children in and open doors to be sent out in your name. We, we gather, gather as your, as your people. people. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we have uh, an opening to God time, uh, a prayer uh, that comes from a, a source called 21st Century Africana from the uh, African-American tradition. I invite you to a time in a space of prayer. Quiet your hearts and minds. Breathe deeply and be fully present where you are and knowing you are fully present to God and virtually fully present with one another. Breathe deep. My soul smiles. My heart dances. My fears flee. My mind wrestles. My tongue shouts praise. My loneliness finds company. My spirit meets God. Surely we are in the house of the Lord. There's plenty good room. Plenty good room. Plenty, Plenty good, good room, room in, in God's, God's house. house. Amen. And, and today we remember that though we often think of God's house as the church, this is God's house wherever you are. I read um, Psalm 31 verses 1 through 5, 9 through 10, and 14 through 16. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame in your righteousness. Deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock and a refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into my hand, I commit your spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my ears with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery and my bones waste away. 
but I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from my, the hand of my enemies and my persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Louise. The Psalms <clears throat> are so wonderful because they uh, express every human emotion. Uh, they're honest before God. Uh, our reading from the gospel is pretty honest before God as well. Jesus is in the midst of saying goodbye to his disciples in the 14th chapter of John. Would you like me to be the disciples? Sure, you okay. can be the disciple. That'll be great. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus is dealing with his own grief, knowing what is to come, but he's also having to uh, deal with the grief of his, of his followers, his students, his disciples, his friends. So he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In Abba's house, in my father's house, in my mother's house, in the house of love, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself so that where you are, I am also. Where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, actually, Lord, <laughs> we do not know the place where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. And I am truth. And I am life. No one comes to Abba except through me. If you know me, you will know Abba also. From now on, you do know God and have seen God. Philip said to him, Lord, show us God, and then we'll be satisfied. And Jesus face palmed, not really. <laughs> but Jesus said, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen Abba. Trust that I am in Abba and Abba is in me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This reading from John 14 gets read often at funerals. I think I've read it at every funeral I've um, ever participated in, um, because of the beginning of it. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to pre prepare a place for you? Those are the words we want to hear, that we need mm -hmm. to hear when we're at a funeral, when we're celebrating the life of someone who's passed that sense that God has a room waiting for us and Jesus is waiting there for us and that all of us, when we pass from this life to the next, will join each other, that's important and that's comforting. Mm -hmm. um, today though, we wanna focus on the fact that this is not just about uh, talking about what happens to us when we die. When Jesus speaks about life in this passage, when he talks about eternal life, when he talks about full life, he's not just talking about the life afterwards. He's talking about the life now, the life here. Um, 
And I love that when he says, you know, the way to the place I'm going, Thomas, bless Thomas's heart. <laughs> He we gets such a bad rap for being doubting Thomas, but he says the question that we all ask, we all wonder. He's <clears> the one that's gutsy enough to say, uh, Lord, we don't know the way to the place you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And to me, that phrase talks about how we live now. It's not just that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life for after we die. He's the way and the truth and the life right now, right this minute. <clears throat> now, I will, uh, I'll confess that the next line that's in John's gospel says, no one will come to Abba or no one will come to the Father except through me. Right? So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that second half has often been used to beat people up and to convince people that if they don't say the sinner's prayer, they're going to hell. To be honest, when I do a funeral, I don't say that second part. Mm -hmm. I say, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's where I stop. That's where I skip to peace I leave with right. you. <laughs> Because at a funeral, there's not enough time to unpack that or to talk about um, how that doesn't mean what it so often has been said to mean. Um, we don't have time to do that here either. That's a whole nother sermon. And no. we figure you only want one sermon this morning. So, so we'll just say using this as a weapon to beat up people because they're, they don't know Jesus yet is wrong. Don't ever, ever do that. It's abusing scripture. It's abusing the word of Jesus. And we'll leave that there. We will. So we're going to just set that aside. So if you have uh, hard feelings about that passage, just kind of put those in a closet for we a minute. We do too. And we're going to, we'll go on from here. So what we're going to talk about this morning is more about what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the way and the truth of the life and the life. We're going to pick apart some of what Thomas said. How can we know the way? I think the word way is wonderful uh, because that was also the first name taken by the infant church before they were ever called church. They called themselves simply the way. They realized that Jesus as the way uh, was not saying a particular prayer or saying a particular confession. It was the way one lived loved was it was a way of being and doing um, one of the great uh prophets uh of the church today is a, a professor named walter brueggemann and uh he uh he says you can find that same concept of of way uh in psalm 31 that we heard earlier uh Brueggemann is a great fan of Sabbath and how uh, he laments how, how moderns and postmoderns have, have given Sabbath away to the powers and principalities of a corporate world. Uh, he says, uh, our concept of time in the West, especially in a capitalist West, is what he calls Promethean time. I guess maybe we'd call it productive time. Time is meant to be used, spent wisely. Uh, time is something we have to fill, we have to master, we have to control, we have to plan out, uh, all with an, an, with an aim of, of achievement, accomplishment, success, uh, and perhaps money-making, which, which is not the same as making a living, it's making more. Uh, and when we're in quarantine, it's really frustrating to live in Promethean or productive time because for many of us, it simply doesn't allow for that. Uh, a household, unlike a business, uh, has, has no reward system. Uh, That's true. There is no competition except when we play Scrabble. Uh, there's nothing to buy, there's nothing to possess, there's nothing to expand within our house. Uh, and so Brueggemann says, we become restless during 
a time of quarantine, if we're still operating on Promethean or productive time. Uh, uh, restless meaning you're unable, he says, to enter into restorative rest. If you're living in Promethean time, you never Sabbath. Uh, so he says maybe uh, in quarantine time, our calling is to rediscover a different kind of time, a Sabbath time, what he calls a covenant time, uh, a time for our not being human doings, but to be human beings. Uh, Psalm 31 uh, has a wonderful line, my times are in your hand. Maybe Psalm 31 can teach us to see quarantine time differently, not as a, uh, a time to accomplish, but rather a time to be in relationship, to be in relationship with God, to be in relationship with the earth, to be in relationship with others, to be in relationship with ourselves in a healthier way. Again, Brueggemann calls this covenant time, Sabbath time, where he, we have a freedom from the need to produce. We have scope to trust, in God. We have the capacity to attend to others, perhaps virtually, perhaps in person with the people nearby, to being vulnerable, to being faithful. Psalm 31 talks a lot about God being a refuge, um, right in the middle of all of the difficult things that are happening mm -hmm. in our lives. And there's that verse in 15 that you mentioned about my times are in your hand, which we, we can say that when we know that all time is in God's hands and our time is part of that. Mm -hmm. um, in verse four, the Psalm 31 says, Lord, take me out of the net that is hidden for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I read that in a couple of different ways in this quarantine time. One is take me out of the net of, I don't want to, catch or spread COVID, right? Mm. So that, that uh, mm. virus net. Um, I also think that that net of feeling like productive time is the only kind of time. Mm. That too is a snare. And I feel like Psalm 31 invites me to, to ask God to rescue me from that being the only way that I decide that my days are worthwhile. Mm. And then in verse 8, Psalm 31 says, you have set my feet in a broad place. And again, it's a sense of, with you, God, it's going to be okay. Everything's good. Um, Psalm 31 reminds us that God's here right in the middle of this with us. And that God is faithful, even if we fall away. God always is present with us. So it's all well and good. Uh, pr productive time is useful. Promethean mm -hmm. time is necessary sometimes. And this is what allows us to uh, grow food, to actually have dinner on the <clears throat> table at a regular time every night, um, to help out the kids who are trying to do schoolwork in our houses. All of those things are productive time. It's just, it's not the whole story. Right. And our society tells us so often that it's the whole story not only for our scheduling, but also how we define ourselves. Absolutely. And so part of this sheltering time is, one of the gifts of this sheltering time is that it's a reminder to us that productive time is all well and good and covenantal time is also important. It's also central to who we are. That's that great deep truth of, of Sabbath. Yeah, we have six days of productive time, of Promethean time, but there is a day to draw back from that, to realize that ultimately we're not defined by a schedule. We're not defined by the needs of a corporation. We're not defined by other people's expectations, but just our relationship with God. Uh, and our, the church's job historically, uh, and the rabbi's job before that was to witness to and value and provide space for covenantal time. The church's job has been to remind people uh, against the, the dominant culture that, hey, you, you don't belong to the company. 
You belong to love. You belong to God. And we are going to make space for that to happen. The church hasn't always done that very well. Uh, no. Or, but, yeah. Not always, but we do the best we can. Um, and again, this time when we're not in church together, when church is so thrown up uh, in the air, gives us a chance to think about what is it that's really central? Mm. What is it that's important to us about church? How are the ways that we can witness to that covenant time here and now, other than when we gather together and worship physically? And so one of those practices is prayer. The church has always said that regardless of how busy and crazy things are, there is always time for prayer. And prayer while you're doing something counts as just as much as prayer when you're sitting in quiet someplace. Um, and that almost always there's times to stop take a breath, offer to God what we're doing, and then ask God for guidance going forward. Church teaches that to mm -hmm. folk. Uh, I, it would probably make me itch if I lived in it, but one of the things I respect about Islam is that there, multiple times a day, five times everything a day. five times a day, everything mm -hmm. stops. You can be in the middle of a contract negotiation and everything stops and a reminder we belong to God. We belong to God. Uh, it's making a, 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 a prayer space, a, a Sabbath space. That's the other thing the church is, is uh, ultimately supposed to be, be sharing about. Uh, to make uh, a space, uh, a rest from producing. Uh, there's an environmental aspect to it. Of just not, not, not only let ourselves simply be who we are as children of God, but to let, let creation just be creation. Uh, you can take time to let the world be good in and of itself, just as God said in, in Genesis one, uh, the trees, they are good. They're not, they're good in themselves. They're not good just because I can build a house out of them. Um, they are good gifts of God. And another way that I think church reminds us of the importance of covenant time is mm -hmm. that Church is all about caring for the vulnerable, mm -hmm. not because it's more productive, not because it's effective, not because it's an achievement, but simply because the vulnerable are vulnerable because our, our job is to show God's love to those folk. Um, and so it's not about being productive, though mm -hmm. there are aspects of being productive maybe in the way that we care, but the caring itself, the desire, the drive to care for the poor, for the lonely, for the alien among us. That is part of what the church preserves mm -hmm. for us. Even, even the sacraments that we do point toward that. Uh, there's, a, there's a subversive quality to the sacraments. It's not just doing stuff with water or doing stuff with bread and wine, but in, in, in baptism, when, when we are named as a child, of God, it says that we have value just by being. We have value as a child of God. We are named as children of God, uh, rather than uh, being being a set of data points. We're we're not we're not part of an algorithm. A child has meaning and value uh, above being uh, uh, a particular uh, file drawer at Amazon that helps people uh, point advertising at them. We are children of God. Right. And communion is subversive too. Even mm -hmm. when we celebrate communion at our various homes as we did last Sunday. That's subversive because the bishops didn't like it. Yeah, that's well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, and you know, bishops don't know everything. Um, but communion is, a, is an aspect of covenant time in the sense that it binds us together with each other. And it also joins us together with God who continue and Jesus who feeds us with his very self, mm -hmm. feeds our spirits, feeds our bodies. The church witnesses to covenant time in all these ways, prayer and Sabbath and caring for the vulnerable, baptism, communion. Mm -hmm. So the church at its best offers a way that is subversive, that, is, that goes uh, against the dominant 
paradigm, the dominant empire. Uh, maybe this is what Jesus meant by way and truth and life, finding that in him, finding that in Abba, uh, following that in a particular way of life. Uh, maybe that's what Jesus meant when he talked about God's big house having many, many rooms, many dwelling places, that, that, that there, there's an assurance that we all belong. Uh, and that, that assurance gives us freedom to, to uh, live constantly in, in covenantal time. Uh, there is that, and that is a way of living. There is truth uh, to still being productive, but knowing all time is in God's hand. There is life, life abundant, life eternal uh, in knowing a God so, so intimate that Jesus could call and invite us to call this God, not, not king, uh, not majesty, but, but Abba, uh, not, not just father, but, but daddy, mommy, uh, intimate, vulnerable, loving parent. That, that's who it is we're invited into relationship with it. And we can live out of that assurance mm -hmm. and we can live in to that assurance. So my spirit is always filled when I happen across an example of someone who lives that assurance, mm. who embodies it, whose very life is just full of it till it's just brimming over. Um, and this morning, we want to share with you a video um, that was made by the uh, Broadway actor Andre de Shields. Uh, Mitch and I were fortunate enough to be able to see Andre about a year ago mm -hmm. in a Broadway production of Hades Town in New York City, back when New York City was holding Broadway productions. Um, last spring, he won a Tony for his performance in that uh, production of Hades Town. Um, he's also the graduate of the University of Wisconsin Madison, and I think 1970. Maybe, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. And um, back when Madison was Madison. Well, yeah, like we know. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know if he was supposed to be the commencement speaker or not, but I know that he posted on YouTube and Facebook a shout out to the graduates of the 2020 class of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I want to show you, we want to show you um, a few minutes, a couple of minutes of that posting. So Jeremy's going to play this, and Jeremy was the one who found this and showed it to us. So yes. thank you so much for uh, getting us in touch with this video. This is Andre De Shields sending a delicious shout out to my young friends who constitute the 2020 graduating class of my alma mater, the University of Wisconsin, Madison. First things first. This is not the fall of the American civilization. This is not the end of the world. Do not prepare for the apocalypse. What is it then? This is our opportunity to create a new earth, to look at the journey we are traveling, discover what we have done incorrectly and correct it prepare for the future for which you are the beacon leading us. So don't give up, don't give in, don't give over. Understand that you are in the right place at exactly the right time. You have the right tools, you have the right ambition, you have prepared well, now, understand that there is an horizon waiting for you to discover. There is a treasure waiting for you to uncover. There is a mystery waiting for you to decode. There is a destiny waiting for you to unfold. All right. Uh, normally, 
this cynical guy is pretty allergic to happy, clappy, positive thinking. And when you say this guy, you mean you? Me. You're not talking about Andre. I'm not talking about Andre. Okay. Uh, I, I really uh, am uncomfortable seeing com- <laughs> seeing comfortable people telling really uncomfortable people to, uh, to get a be happy attitude and pick themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, but Andre De Shields is not one of those comfortable people. He is a man who knows what a real hard life is and his amazing words come out of some serious life. <clears throat> he is, he has lived 73 years as a black man in the United States. He knows what it is to live underneath a system that's oppressive. He has 73 years as a gay black man in the United States. He totally knows what it is to be under the feet of a system that doesn't like you on more than one count. And he is a man who has lived for 30 years HIV positive. Right. He is a man who knows what it is to be sick, to be assumed to be a dead man walking, uh, to be devalued and shut out, uh, and, uh, and be a victim of God's wrath uh, because of that disease. So he has credentials. And if he's a 73-year-old man, a uh, gay man in the United States who himself is HIV positive, you know that he has been to dozens and dozens of funerals in the 80s and the 90s of friends and colleagues um, who did not survive the AIDS pandemic. You know, one, I think one of the reasons Andre can say that this is not the apocalypse, this mm-hmm. COVID thing is not the apocalypse is because this is not his first apocalypse. I think all the ways that he's lived in this culture have been a series of apocalypses that he's had to not overcome, but live through Mm -hmm. and come out on the other end, clear about who he is and what he's about. Andre has lived a life where he knows what hardship is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, we know that he was raised in a devout Christian home. Mm -hmm. Uh, He says he does not believe in a God of hellfire and brimstone anymore. That's Uh, okay. Neither do I. Neither do we. (laughs) Uh, I I came out of that tradition and and gave it a a goodbye a long time ago. Uh, And I don't know the details of of his theology. but you can tell by the way he lives and shares and loves that he is committed uh, to a way, I think the way, uh, he's committed to uh, what Brueggemann calls a, a covenantal time that honors possibility, that honors freedom, that honors love, uh, honors himself, even though the world doesn't, uh, and honors others. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is committed to living an eternal life that begins now. Right. And that's what I hear when he says that phrase, you are in the right place at exactly the right time. You are in the right place at exactly the right time. And so he's telling that to those new graduates. Mm -hmm. He's telling it to us as well, to me, to you, to all of us. And so this week, our invitation to you all is that you hold these two phrases together in your spirit. One is Andre de Shield saying to you, you are in the right place at exactly the right time. So hold that phrase and then also hold Jesus's phrase. I am the way and the truth and the life. Ponder those and see what God has to say to you about your life, about your place in this time, how it is you will live out as a person, live out your life as a person of the way, who knows your calling, who knows that you are blessed to be a blessing, no matter how unblessed 
your life might look right now. And if you think about those two phrases and you have no idea what to do with either one of them, if like Thomas, you're like, okay, Andre, maybe you're at the right place at the right time, but I don't know about me. And if you say to Jesus, well, excuse me, what, what is the way to the place where you are going? If you don't know what to do with that, then our counsel to you is that you ask Jesus, that you lift him up in prayer and you say, Jesus, God, spirit, however you address the holy, however you address the power of life and love in the universe and say, show me, show me how I am in the, in the right place at exactly the right time. Show me the way that you would have me live and see what comes. I will warn you that you should only do this in prayer if you're ready for the answer. <laughs> because my experience is that when we honestly say to God, I don't really know what your way is, show me, God answers. Um, and that answer almost always comes in ways that we would never have expected. And sometimes in ways that we've been holding off for a long time. Um, I also can promise you that there is more life and more truth and more love in the living out of that answer. So that we too can come to the place where like Andre, the goodness of life and of God's possibilities in us just spills out of all we're doing, even if we're broadcasting out of our kitchen, right? Instead of standing on a stage. May this be so for you, for us, for all our world. Amen. 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 Uh, in the <laughs> bulletin that uh, I sent out in the uh, Essex Center uh, newsletter uh, has a prayer of the people uh, that we're not going to do today, but uh, it's also one of those real life, mm. real life prayers, a lot like a psalm, uh, a yearning for a God who knows our suffering and indeed does suffer. Uh, so that might be helpful for you during the week. Uh, our prayer of the people that we're going to share now uh, over the interwebs uh, comes from uh, the Reverend Becca Durrell, uh, who uh, is going to be uh, the pastor uh, in Morrisville here very soon. Uh, and she has a prayer, also a very psalm-like prayer for Mother's Day uh, that's about real life. So we're going to share this prayer together. Um, we invite you to send us any prayer concerns that you would like us to lift up verbally at the end of this prayer. Um, I've been taking some notes as we go, and you can send others as you wish. Um, and then once we've lifted up those prayer concerns, we'll share together in the Lord's Prayer, and we invite you to do that from your home as well. So um, this prayer for Mother's Day uh, from Becca Gurel. God, we pray today on Mother's Day and offer a blessed Mother's Day to all who celebrate and to all who grieve and who are burdened with mixed emotions today. Today we pray for those who have complicated relationships with their mothers or with their children. And at times that is all of us. Today we pray for those who long to be with their mother or with their child and know Zoom just doesn't fix that. Thank you very much. We want to be there in person. Today, we pray for those who have longed to be mothers. We pray for all those who find other ways to be maternal. And those whose hurt is not healed. We pray for those who've lost their mothers, whether that's recently or decades ago. And we pray for all those who've lost their children because of this pandemic, before they were even born and drew their first breath, because they were jogging. We pray for the mother of Armad Arbery this morning and for the hundreds like her whose children are killed by racism, by discrimination, for reasons that have no name or no purpose. 
We pray for mothers who are detained or incarcerated apart from their children and the children who are detained and incarcerated apart from their parents. We pray for this earth, our mother, for healing and for strength and for the wisdom to offer cure and caring. And we pray for all of us, God, who strive to be better children, better siblings, better parents, so that in our homes, peace and justice and love might prevail for us and for all of God's children. This morning, I lift up my mom, who taught me not the historical faith, but a deep living faith for now, faith on God who parents us tenderly. We pray for June, who is with her mom in the nursing home and seems to be in her last days. We pray with Dana for Ping Pong, who has been diagnosed uh, with cancer. And for Morrisville, we left up prayers for Betty Harvey, who continues to be in hospital, um, and for Bill and, and, um, and for the Lazats who care for her. We pray for Bob and Amanda Parker. We pay, pray for Gordon Gray, Carol Olson's brother, who cut off two of his fingers this last week and have had them reattached. Pray for his healing. We pray for all the moms in whatever places they are, moms on the front lines, moms whose children are on the front lines of this epidemic, moms who are struggling to uh, increase their education so that they can provide better care for their children. We pray for all of your people, God, in these days. And hear us as we lift the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread. bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we head out into uh, a world of both Promethean time and covenantal time, uh, we have some announcement. A world where it's still snowing. A world where it is still <laughs> snowing. Brueggemann didn't mention snowing time. Right. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll be having our uh, regular uh, uh, Zoom coffee hour. Uh, so invite you to that. Uh, I am a week late trying to get uh, the Netflix watch party uh, working for our Monday companions. Uh, so I will uh, get that out to you in a week from Monday. We will watch a Coen Brothers film and discuss the theological uh, aspects of that dark and funny film. Uh, in Morrisville, um, I think on Tuesday, the Pastoral Relations Committee will be having a Zoom meeting. I know the trustees will be having a meeting on Thursday. Um, Wednesday at seven o'clock, again, I'll lead a spiritual practices for uncertain times um, on Facebook. I invite you to come and be part of that. And the Morrisville Zoom check-in will be again on Friday evening uh, at seven o'clock this week. And then of course, next Sunday, We'll be back together here in our dining room and all of your dining rooms as well. Can you give us a good word to go out on? Oh. <clears throat> I invite all of you as you walk through the week, all of us as we walk through the week, siblings, children of a divine 
mother, father, parent, who loves us. And we can live secure in that, whether we're being productive or we're simply being uh, go, being assured of that deep, deep love of the God who is creator and redeemer and sustainer now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, y'all. And uh, thanks in advance to Sean Boer for the music that we'll be closing out with this morning. Be well. Peace.